Hi, so we're going to talk a bit about emulsifiers and mesothens, which are wonderfully complex but very important chemicals, which we always get asked about in our tastings and are often used in, but almost invariably used in ultra processed foods and almost always used in mass produced chocolate and occasionally even used in craft chocolates. And I'd like to start by just explaining what an emulsifier actually is. So, as anybody who's ever made a salad dressing will know, when you try and mix vinegar and oil, they pretty rapidly separate. They basically don't want to mix together. However, cooks for hundreds of years have known if you add a little bit of egg to it or a little bit of mustard seeds, you can actually get them to bind. That's called emulsification. And emulsifiers, like eggs, have been used for a long time by cooks. So, for example, ice cream, you know, which dates back to the 17th, 18th century in Europe, often used emulsifiers in the form of eggs to basically bind everything together, but also to give it a different mouthfeel. So, back in 1846, a guy called Tien Goblin, and if any of you are experts on vanilla and vinyl, then you will re recognize his name because he's the guy who first isolated vanillin. Anyway, back in 1846, Gobley worked out how to create lesser things from eggs. And this is the start of basically being able to use lesser things as a simple additive and not necessarily use mustard seeds and not necessarily use lots of other naturally occurring emulsifiers. For example, Japanese use lots of seaweeds. It's the idea of actually starting to process lesser thins and additives and use those in your food. Move on about another 100 years, actually to the 1920s, and a couple of Brits are actually applying for a lot of patents to start using soya-based lesser thins inside chocolate. This is really the start of people working out that you can use a lesser thin because it's much cheaper and much easier to use than cocoa butter when you're making chocolate. And if you dial forward, it also starts to get people into the ultra-processed food, which we've talked about in a separate video. What's more interesting now is that you've basically got two and a half camps inside the use of lesser things in chocolate. You've got mass-produced chocolate, which uses lesser things and fats, so this sort of stuff extensively. But if you look at the back of, say, you know, any sort of classic supermarket or um, vendor-based machine, you'll see a whole bunch of different things like E446, E478, etc. Those are all lesser things, as is PGPR, plus things like palm oils, plus things like shears. Craft chocolate will generally not use any sort of lesser than. Occasionally it will, and we'll explain to you why that happens in another area. If it does use a lesser than, craft chocolate will almost invariably use sunflower lesser than. Sunflower lecithin is different from soy lecithin in the sense that, first of all, it can be processed naturally, which means it doesn't require chemical processes to extract it. But secondly, unlike soy lecithin, it doesn't have any known allergic reactions or allergies. And thirdly, there is actually some evidence, although you need it in much bigger volumes than it's put into scrub chocolate, that sunflower lecithin actually can help in certain conditions. The craft chocolate makers are aware of the fact that sometimes trying to get somebody to have like a Bejoffo estate, single estate bar, and they see it for six pounds, they don't really understand what that's about. So it's a bit of a difficult one to sell. So to try and bridge you into craft chocolates, try and sort of help you get through to it, what they'll do is they'll put like interesting ingredients. A great example of this is someone like Omnop, who produced everything from sort of their black and burnt bar to their coffee bars to all sorts of bars with fantastic inclusions. But most craft chocolate makers will have a few really interesting inclusion bars. Zossa is another great example. Now, because some of these inclusions don't want to bind very well with the chocolate, you need a bit of emulsifiers. And that's why you'll occasionally see emulsifiers in those. There are also some makers, like for example, Menacal, who want their chocolate to be used extensively by cooks and in baking. And in those cases, a lot of bakers and uh, people who are basically using chocolate to mold it and that sort of stuff, and they want a good shine on it, will actually use the emulsifier. So sometimes it actually gets included into the kombucha of someone like Manikau will make. And then the third reason is very technical and very, very geeky, but it goes as follows. And this is a good example um, if you want to sort of understand why a great maker like Firetree, even in their dark chocolate bars, will occasionally use a bit of sunflower lecithin. 
which is that if you've ever had one of Partridge's baths, what you'll know is that it has this fantastic melt. It has this amazing unctuousness to it. And what's happening here is that they're grinding the microns incredibly fine. They're grinding the nibs to an incredibly fine level. But when you do that, you sort of get a few which are ground super fine, and then a few which you can't sort of quite grind that fine. And that discrepancy creates a slightly strange mouthfeel. Now, if you want to sort of basically create a very smooth mouthfeel, you can add a lesser than, sunflower lesser than in this case, and you'll basically smooth out those edges. Other makers insist that they can basically smooth out those edges because of the way in which they grind and which they conch. So a good example of that is, for example, Nikel Fritz Holm uses a longitudinal conch. And again, sort of someone like Pump Street will also, even though they have inclusion bars, they won't be using lesser than. The fundamental bit here is just, again, look at the label. If you see a bunch of emulsifiers, PGPR included in there, like a number of other e-numbers, you see a bunch of things like palm oils, shea fats, and everything else, you know that it's an ultra-processed food. You know that it's all about the bliss point. You know that it's all about artificial texture. If, however, you see really simple ingredients which your grandmother would recognize, and your grandmother probably just about would recognize less of them because they were around there, but a single less of them, or just the very simple ingredients which you'd sort of get in this sort of bar, which is just basically a little bit of cocoa beans, a little bit of milk, a little bit of cocoa butter, and Bob's your uncle. That means that it's all going to be about the flavor. It's all going to be about savoring. It's not designed to try and get you to scoff. 